Moving on, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, um, Jen, Jennifer Lai. Uh, we uh, recruited Jen, you know, he's like a first round draft pick. Um, so uh, four years ago, and, uh, and I think it's more than first, you know, it's like a first pick. So, um, and we, uh, you know, she really blossomed in the, in the national scene within a short time and uh, was able to get uh, you know, many research awards in NIH and ACG, career development, and, uh, and she's the uh, PI of this NIH-funded frailty study, frailty. And this is applying to patients with end-stage liver disease before liver transplantation, I think is really groundbreaking and uh, a potentially game changer and uh, can't wait to hear the talk in this really amazing work. So, Jen. Thank you so much, Francis, for that kind introduction. It really is an honor to uh, be invited to speak again, and truly an honor to be speaking at this conference on behalf, uh, in honor of uh, Dr. Bass. Um, so this is my absolute favorite topic. Um, it, it, I eat, sleep, and breathe frailty, and I sort of can't understand why no one else does. So I see it as my job to convince you. I have the next 20 minutes to convince you that you also should be totally obsessed with this topic. So I want you just to picture in your head a patient you with cirrhosis you have recently cared for who you whom you described as frail. This could have been an outpatient you saw, um, maybe you know, thought to refer that patient to us for liver transplant. This could have been an inpatient who decompensated with cirrhosis. So now I want you to think about other words and descriptors and characteristics about that patient that made you think that patient was frail. I want to hear from you what these words are. Go ahead and shout them out. Cachectic. Weak, weak. Wasted. Lack of mobility. Feeble. feeble. Oh, feeble, yeah, that's a good one. So I had the opportunity to ask my own hepatology colleagues the same question. What words do you most closely associate with frail? And I heard very much the same words. This is what they told me. Wasted, debilitated, breakable, vulnerable, elderly, fragile, sick, cachectic, old, and weak. And I've fashioned this in sort of word cloud way. So the fact that I heard two weeks is very, very uh, fitting because everybody told me weak and then they gave me a second word. And if we look at all of these words together, surrounding this word frail, all of them associated with frail, I hope you can understand why I consider frailty to be the single most powerful concept in transplant medicine. For a patient with end-stage liver disease who is coming to us seeking liver transplantation, this single word can be the sole determinant for declining them for transplant listing, or if that patient is already listed for liver transplantation, it can be the sole determinant for removing them from the wait list entirely. At the current time, we rely largely on one single instrument for our assessments of frailty, and that is the eyeball test. And while there's no doubt that the eyeball test is critically important to our transplant decisions, we, we can't do without it. It's also subjective. It detects frailty at really only its most advanced stages. It can be influenced by factors that may not be relevant to transplant decisions, like socioeconomic status, the way a person is groomed or dressed, and it is variably applied to transplant decision making. So I don't know if you've ever encountered the circumstance that one of your patients who was frail was turned down for transplant. 
another patient who was frail was actually accelerated to transplant. And for these reasons, I believe there is a great need for more objective metrics to really anchor our assessments of frailty in patients with end-stage liver disease. And I'm really pleased to present to you data from the Functional Assessment in Liver Transplantation Study, or Frailty for short, which has been going on at UCSF since 2012. And in this study, all patients who are listed for liver, or I should say most outpatients who are listed for liver transplantation at UCSF, who are seen in our outpatient hepatology clinics and who show up to their clinic visit without very severe hepatic encephalopathy as identified by their numbers connection test are eligible to enroll. Of those who are eligible to enroll, 97% have agreed to participate, which is really a testament to how persuasive and how excellent my study coordinators are. At enrollment, all, all patients are undergoing testing using tools to assess physical frailty that, are, that fall into either a performance-based or self-reported categories, and I'll tell you a little bit more about these tests in the next slide. They undergo these tests of frailty at enrollment, and then once they are enrolled, they undergo testing at every clinic visit while they are on the transplant list, and then after transplant, we follow their physical function and frailty for another one year after transplant to assess their recovery. So I want to tell you a little bit more about these objective metrics of frailty. For the large part, they all have been borrowed from the field of geriatrics. Now, if you think about it, um, Really, as a hepatologist, I, I actually never thought that I would have anything in common with a geriatrician. The average liver transplant candidate is 57 or 58 years of age, hardly geriatric by chronologic terms. However, um, both geriatricians and I, as a transplant hepatologist, are managing patients at the very end of their lives. And so the concepts that geriatricians use to make decisions about their patients are very applicable to the, to the, um, the concepts that I need to use as transplant hepatologists to help assess and make decisions for my patients as well. Some of these instruments are composite instruments, like the freed frailty instrument, other instruments, um, or the short physical performance battery test, and they consist of some of these measures. There's a measure of grip strength, which is just using a hand dynamometer, and you ask the patient to squeeze. Uh, we ask patients to stand up and sit down from a chair five times. We also test their ability to balance in three different positions, 10 seconds each. We also assess a very short gait speed so just 13 feet, and we ask them to do it three different times so we can average their gait speed. We also are administering self-reported questionnaires. So we do do a brief uh, depression screen. Uh, we assess their physical activity that they do for leisure. We assess their disability using activities of daily living scale as well as the instrumental activities of daily living scale. Uh, we're actually at about 900 patients right now in this frailty study cohort that have been enrolled since uh, 2012. Uh, the median age of our cohort is 58 years. 41% are female, 58% are non-Hispanic white. The median meld sodium score is 18. The median albumin is three. The median child pew score is eight, so that puts them in child's B, really reflective of the fact this is a decompensated liver transplant population. Median follow-up time is 11 months. These demographics are exactly identical to the national demographics. So what we're seeing at UCSF and what we have enrolled in our frailty cohort is really representative, really applicable to the general liver transplant population. And we have found some really interesting results using these geriatric assessments of frailty. What we have found is that nearly one in five patients are classified as frail by a very classic instru geriatric instrument called the Freed Frailty Test. 40% show signs of functional impairment by the short physical performance battery, another classic geriatric instrument, and a third of them have difficulty with at least one activity of daily living. Now, that may not, they, that may not sound like a lot, um, you know, just one, one uh, uh, deficit, but activities of daily living are an extremely low bar. We are asking patients if they can feed themselves, dress themselves, bathe themselves, go to the toilet, transfer from a 
a bed to a chair. These are outpatients we're asking if they can feed themselves, and one in three are telling us that they can't. And when we look at uh, these rates of frailty that we're uh, observing in the outpatient liver transplant population, these rates are equivalent to community dwelling adults who are 85 years and older. So in other words, patients who are listed for liver transplant with a median age of 58 years are acting physiologically as if they are three decades older than they really are. And these are the patients we are taking to the operating room for a major surgery. Um, so we wonder why they have prolonged length of stay in the hospital, why they are hospitalized so frequently, why they require so much support while they're in the hospital and through discharge. It's because, they're, it's because we're taking octogenarians to the OR. We've also found that um, these measures of frailty from the geriatrics literature are really powerful prognostic indicators. This figure shows the rates of waitlist mortality, so that's a combined outcome of death or delisting for liver transplant, and it's classified, categorized by their MELD score with low MELD patients on the left, high MELD patients on the right, um, and by their frailty status. And as you can see, patients who are classified as frail, as shown by the dark gray bar, have clinically and statistically significantly higher rates of weightless mortality as compared to those who are not frail. And importantly, this is independent of their MELD score. So even among those patients who have a high MELD score, frailty still emerges as an important predictor and, uh, of mortality in this population. We've also been looking at their frailty and measuring their frailty in a longitudinal fashion. And these figures show um, their rates of, or their, their scores of gait speed, chair stands, and the composite short physical performance battery um, over the course of time on the transplant list. So basically from their first assessment when they enrolled in the study, and then their last assessment when they enrolled in the study. And this is among those patients who ultimately died or were delisted. And you can see this is a really rapid downward trajectory. Now, if I were to show a geriatric audience this, this, uh, these graphs, they would say, oh, this, you know, you must have been observing these patients for, for the last eight or ten years. But in our population, this is happening at a median of 8.4 months. So this is an extraordinarily dynamic process that's happening in our patients. And quite honestly, because we've not been measuring it, we're completely unprepared to help our patients and support our patients through this process. Now, at the same time, you know, I'm showing these graphs to you, but of course, at the same time, their liver disease severity is worsening. And so it was really important for me as a researcher to make sure that what I was uh, that frailty was actually capturing something that wasn't liver disease, that, that it really was capturing a separate concept, that I wasn't just mirroring their liver disease. And so we did some modeling in order to try to separate the out and adjust out for, the, for their uh, liver disease severity. And so I want to just show you three um, hypothetical patients. Um, they're all male. They have average baseline frailty scores. So they, they, they all start at baseline at the same level of frailty. They all start at the same MELD score, and they all have the same trajectory of MELD over time. Now, the only factor that I vary in these th next three graphs that I'll show you are actually their, their trajectories of frailty. So patient number one um, has pretty much no trajectory of frailty. This is the patient who walks in. Every visit is just stable, 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 um, and, and continues to walk in just as fast and is feeling well and is still working. Um, and this is their survival. So now you can see here, um, actually, I have to follow them in, in this hypothetical situation. I have to follow them for 12 months to get their frailty scores, and then this is where I let them sort of be natural. Um, and so this is a very average uh, weightless survival curve for a transplant candidate. Now let's take this exact same patient. Everything else about this patient is stable, but all I do is I vary, in this case, their grip strength, and I make their grip strength go down by just a little bit. So every three months, their grip strength goes down by one kilogram. And this is what he does. He has a... Um, 
a, a slight decline in their uh, survival curve relative to the patient who is stable. But if I take a third patient, everything exactly the same, but their grip strength really starts to decline now much more rapidly, by two kilograms every three months, they have an extraordinarily steep decline. So again, really going to show that um, frailty is an important determinant of uh, prognosis in our patients, that baseline frailty is important, trajectory of frailty is also in, important independent of their baseline frailty scores. So lest you think that frailty is just a UCSF phenomenon, no, our patients are not just are not the only ones who are frail. Actually, there are a lot of there are a couple of other groups um, in the United States that have also been testing frailty and we're using different other measures, and I wanted to just show you some of their data that really supports, I think, what we have found at UCSF. So in one study by Elizabeth Carey in uh, Mayo Scottsdale, uh, she looked at um, average six-minute walk test distance. So this is the distance that a patient walks in six minutes. Six minutes is a very long time for a patient with cirrhosis. It's really a test of endurance, and many people think it's a test of cardiopulmonary reserve. The average six-minute walk test distance in a, in a cohort of 100 50 liver transplant candidates was 369 meters. Now, to put this um, in context, that's about two tenths of a mile. Two tenths of a mile, six minutes. This is av averaging out to a 30 minute mile. So, think about that. I mean, all of us in this room, we can walk at a slow, comfortable pace, a 20 minute mile. Think about how slow and how hard it would be for you to walk a 30 minute mile. Think about patient individuals, not just patients, but think about individuals who you who actually do in real life do a 30 minute mile. For me, that's like my grandma. You know, so I'm, you know, I'm already thinking about 80 year old, 90 year old people. So again, really reinforcing that, that frailty is capturing that physiologic aging. And um, in this study, every 100 meter increase Increase in frailty, or sorry, increase in the six minute walk test distance. So that means improvement. So this person is stronger, is associated with a 42% decrease in waitlist mortality. In a separate study using activities of daily living, um, they used a cutoff of less than 12 out of a total of 15. This ADL score um, of less than 12 was associated with a two-fold increased odds of death at 90 days, a four-fold increased odds of death, or sorry, odds of discharge to a rehab facility. And lastly, in a study that looked at just gait speed, um, investigators at the University of Pittsburgh found that for every 0.1 meter per second decrease, which is a clinically um, meaningful difference in gait speed, um, this was associated with a 22% increased uh, risk of, of hospital or rate of hospitalizations per year. Um, so to put this in context, compared to a cirrhotic patient with a gait speed of 1.0 meters per second, a patient, another patient who is equivalent, but who has only, who, whose only difference is that their gait speed is 0.5 meters per second, um, will have 15 extra hospital, hospitalized days per year, so half an extra month spent in the hospital at a total cost of 60,000 per year. So again, these studies just really overall reinforce this concept that frailty is extremely important in our patients. So where we are today, I hope that at the very least I've been able to convince you that frailty is highly prevalent in patients with end-stage liver disease, that these assessments that have been uh, borrowed from the field of geriatrics, these assessments of frailty um, have construct validity. They, they really do describe what we're trying to describe in our population, and they are feasible to be tested in our population, um, and on top of that, that these objective metrics um, have prognostic value. But the reality is that you probably didn't need to listen to me talk for the last 10 minutes to know that frailty is important. We all know, as just clinicians, as people who take care of patients, that when a patient looks frail by our eyeball test, that patient is not going to do very well. And I think we can all agree, even before I started talking, that objective metrics to measure frailty is probably a good thing. So I guess the question that I always have is, well, why haven't we started using them? Why is it that nobody, including at UCSF, has really implemented objective metrics of frailty into their clinical practice and into their decision making? And one of the 
problems that I have identified, the challenges, is that today I've actually presented to you actually 10 different tests of frailty. That when people ask me, well, what test should I do? I want to bring it into my clinical practice. I give them, oh, you can do the free, you can do the grip, you can do the short physical performance battery, you can do the gate speed. And there's really no consensus. And so my next mission actually has been to deliver to the community an index that we can all agree that we want to use, that it will be easy to use, um, and so that we can push this field of frailty one step further. And this is the concept of the liver-specific frailty index. Now, I study liver disease, so, this, so that's why this is a liver-specific frailty index, but I really see, how, see a future in which this concept goes much further outside of liver disease to end-stage renal disease, lung disease, heart disease. You can have a frailty index for all organ failure and can be very useful in any organ transplant setting. So uh, over the last year, of it, I've actually been completely absorbed in this concept of the liver-specific frailty index. And when we embarked upon this, this goal, um, we decided that we really only wanted to include tests of physical frailty. We weren't trying to better predict prognosis. The reality is MELD is great. It's easy to use. It's laboratory-based. It really does capture liver disease severity. It's just that as a clinician, I felt like the, the need in our clinical practice was to capture for those maybe 20 percent of people whose sarcopenia, whose wasting, whose cachexia, whose weakness really dominates their prognosis. I wanted a tool to capture them. So we, we only allowed those physical frailty tools, no labs, um, no radiographic tests. And we used the following criteria to select the final index, that it represent multiple domains of frailty. I didn't want just one test. I wanted um, a really composite test, that it have prognostic value, and that it be practical. Because ultimately, if you're not going to use it, then it's not very useful. So here's the final frailty index. These are data that I'll be presenting next week at our liver meeting. It consists of grip strength, chair stands, and balance, and is adjusted for a constant just to make it a little bit more clinically easy or clinically easier to use, and it takes less than 90 seconds to administer in the clinic setting. It really takes about 60 seconds for a robust patient, um, but 90 seconds for the frail, and you know, those are the patients we actually want to spend more time on. And when we looked at the test performance characteristics, um, we found that the net reclassification index was 19%. So when we added the frailty index to meld sodium, this combination, this frailty index improved our risk prediction for mortality in 19% of patients over meld sodium alone. One in five patients are better served by adding the frailty index to meld sodium um, than, than using meld sodium alone. And to just leave you with this final picture of really what that means and what that looks at, I want to just show you some hypothetical survival curves. Now, this, these are predicted survival curves of two groups of patients based on their meld sodium alone. So patients with a meld sodium of 14 and 23, which represents the 20th and 80th percentile cutoff values in our cohort, which is an outpatient cohort. And as expected, patients with a meld sodium, uh, um, or with a higher meld sodium, experience higher weightless mortality than patients with a lower meld sodium. So this is absolutely what we would expect. Now when we um, took, we further stratified patients, not just by their meld sodium scores, but also by their frailty status. And the, for, for the purposes of just displaying this uh, concept to you, we um, chose frailty, we chose patient, we classified patients as frail and robust if they had the 20th and 80th percentile values of the frailty index scores um, in our cohort. And here you can see that in both cases, regardless of their MELD score, frailty, better um, risk stratified patients um, into their correct uh, survival status, that those patients who were frail experienced significantly poorer survival curves than those patients who were robust, again, independent of their MELD sodium scores, independent of their liver disease severity. 
And when, and, and actually it's when we overlay these two graphs that we can really start to appreciate the magnitude of the effect of frailty in our patients that we care for. With patients with a low meld sodium, um, who's frail, experiencing the exact same survival probability as a higher meld patient who is robust. In other words, you could conceptually think of, and I can prove it to you statistically as well, that being frail is like having nine extra meld sodium points. So this is a difference of somebody with a meld 14 to 23 up to the 30s. Think about what a big difference that is from someone going from a 20 to a 30 in their, in their meld sodium scores and their, and their risk of mortality. So I want you to take all of these data and go back to that patient that you were thinking of who you recently saw with cirrhosis, who you, you classified as frail. And, and all of the words that go along with describing a patient who is frail. And I really want us to move to a place where not only do we use these words, because they're important, but we also start thinking about them in more objective terms, that we anchor our assessments in, in words like weak grip few chair stands, poor balance, slow gait, in order to really define what is weak and to define what is frail. And the reason this is so important is that more objective metrics of frailty will then lend themselves better to what we can do next and how we can really improve the care um, to our patients. More than just a descriptor, they, they take us to the next step. So for somebody who has weak grip, which is really a classic marker of malnutrition, that person needs nutritional support. For a patient who can't do very many chair stands, a marker of sarcopenia and muscle wasting, that myostatin antibody medications are just a couple years away. Um, testosterone has recently been shown in a multi-center trial to improve muscle mass and grip strength. For somebody with poor balance, this person needs physical therapy. There are a number of studies in the geriatrics literature that show that physical therapy and targeted strengthening exercises can improve balance and reduce risk of falls. Somebody who has slow gait, um, a marker of cardiopulmonary reserve, needs endurance exercises. They also need strengthening, but they actually need to do more steps. Maybe this is the person who needs to be motivated um, with physical activity. And that way we can turn this word frailty really into something that gets our frail patients, rather than being delisted, we can convert more of them to getting them to transplant. Before I close, I just want to tell you that this is not my study alone. I could not have done it with a huge amount of support from my mentors, um, trainees who have worked with me, and the study staff. And I really just want my study staff over here to raise their hands. Uh, Adrian, Yara, and Rachel are the ones who um, have made this happen, actually. So really are the ones who allow me to write and give talks so that um, they can actually do all the testing. So, if, and if you want your frailty tested, they would be willing to do that as well. So thank you. Okay, uh, question for Dr. Lai. This is terrific. So, yes, Mary Patton. Sure. So the question is, are we using this at this current moment uh, to stratify patients for delisting? So we are not. Um, we are currently in the process of trying to um, just actually incorporate the frailty testing into our, our phase one, um, just so we have the data. But if we're going to make decisions specifically about whether to transplant someone or not, the data that I have not presented to you is actually what happens to them post-transplant. And that is data that I'm collecting. Um, that's data I'm very interested in looking at. Um, but one of the challenges with being a researcher in frailty is that liver transplant outcomes, particularly at UCSF, are so good. So even after, we've been collecting post-transplant data for two years, two and a half years, almost three, and um, out of about 350 transplants in my cohort, we only have 19 deaths to date. So in fact, that data is, a long time away for us to be making the transplant decisions on. What I, my goal at this moment is really so that 
when we when we call it, I mean, I you know, we should still delist patients if we feel as clinicians, based on our experience, that they are not going to do well. I just want to make sure that when we call a patient frail, they really are frail. I've been wrong so many times. I mean, I eat, sleep, and breathe frailty, and I made that mistake the other day when I was on service. I called a patient frail, and it was just because he wasn't a morning person, and he was, you know, he, he was walking around the hallways by the afternoon, you know. So um, I just want to make sure that when we call a patient frail and when we as clinicians have decided that this is not a good thing to proceed with, that, that they have slow gait, that they have poor balance, that they really do have weak grip. Um, so that, that's the goal right now, but absolutely the post-transplant data is key and will be coming when we have enough outcomes to look at. Yeah, you know, even more, so the question is actually, it'd be interesting to see, um, see really the interaction between frailty and the type of transplant, whether it be live donor, deceased donor transplant. So when I have peeked at the data, it matters less about whether the transplant transplant is a live donor or a deceased donor transplant, it really matters whether they, what their MELD score is at transplant. And the beauty of live donor transplant is you get to go to transplant at a lower transplant MELD score. Um, and so that seems to make a huge difference. So we can, it, it, the data is hinting that a frail patient who goes to transplant at a high MELD score does very poorly but a frail patient who goes to transplant at a low MELD score, i.e. with a living donor transplant, does much better. So I think that um, it's, it's an interesting hypothesis in my head I wanna look at when we have enough outcomes that I think frailty can help us identify patients who need living donor. Um, as Dr. Roberts said, our, I mean, our program is awesome, but if we didn't have to do live donor, we would prefer not to involve a donor, and maybe frailty can help us identify which recipients really do need to get a live donor transplant, and in addition, which recipients need to, or which candidates need to go outside of California for a transplant as well. I think that's another really important application of frailty. Dr. Bass. Yeah, so Dr. Bass is asking really kind of the role that hepatic encephalopathy is playing in our in, in frailty. So um, we are excluding patients with severe hepatic encephalopathy. We have set the bar so high that we are only excluding about 2% of patients. So we're, not, we're actually capturing a very wide spectrum of encephalopathy. When we look at the correlations between frailty and portal hypertensive complications, the a complication that frailty most tra tracks most closely with is hepatic encephalopathy. There is a much tighter correlation with encephalopathy than with um, than anything else, than with albumin, than with sodium, than with creatinine. Um, and I, from what I've seen my patients do, and you know, looking at their frailty scores um, and and being able to assess as a clinician their encephalopathy. I, I think that frailty, these frailty tests in part do capture hepatic encephalopathy, um, and I think that's a great thing because right now we can't really assess encephalopathy in clinical practice in a very objective way. We sort of say, I know there are the, 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 you know, the grades, but I would say they're still quite subjective, and if we can get, if we can sort of capture all of the effects of encephalopathy in a continuous metric with the frailty index scores, I think that's a huge improvement. In addition, um, okay, yeah, I'll end there. Last question, Francis. Uh, I have uh, two questions here. Uh, first, um, uh, given the same degree of um, uh, uh, male sodium, have you looked into the association between depression and uh, this uh, uh, frail index? In other words, uh, uh, do people who have also post-system depression, they tend to do poorer on these kind of uh, frailty performance? 
So the question is, what is the association between frailty and depression? So we have not looked at that specifically, our group at frailty in the frailty cohort, um, but it's been looked at actually by a, co um, a group that has a frailty cohort in Michigan, and they have found very strong association between frailty and depression. Um, they they track very closely together. Again, you know, I think these these two questions back to back actually highlight the importance of frailty. Um, frailty is a great way to capture the combination of risk predictors in our patients, right? I mean, sure, we could take depression, we could take encephalopathy, we could take ascites, we could take hypertension and diabetes, all as separate predictors. But what we really want is what is the sum total effect of all of those problems together? What is the end manifestation of um, all of those problems? How is that going to impact as a total package? How is that going to impact um, my patient's outcomes? Um, that's the huge advantage of frailty. It's, it's the way that it was conceptualized in the field of geriatrics, and I feel like our data is showing that it, it works beautifully in patients with cirrhosis as well. I couldn't agree with you more. So the question really is, you know, how do we support these frail patients, whether they're low meld or high meld? How do we support them? And I, I totally agree. We need a multidisciplinary approach to support them. Um, one of the other things that I think is so beautiful about frailty is it's modifiable. Um, I believe it's it. it I believe that at least components of it are modifiable. And so if we really do create programs that help support these frail patients, improve their nutrition, improve their balance, improve their walk speed, um, improve their muscle mass, I think we can not only improve their quality of life, but actually improve their survival, improve and improve their ability to thrive after transplant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. That was wonderful.